Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all found you, the workshops uh, inspiring and thought-provoking. Uh, before we uh, do the report back and hear about your amazing experiences, I want to take a moment to introduce an amazing trailblazing Black woman and our new president of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council, Andrea Babington. Andrea has been on the Labor Council Executive Board since 2004, serving eight years as Vice President. As the first woman of color to sit as president, Andrea is committed to fighting for a just eco economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Equality and justice for all workers. Growing the labor movement by increasing union density and fighting for climate justice to ensure a future for our children. Andrea, floor is all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my brother. And I, I just wanna say, you know, we are just a little bit past 12, just to say good afternoon to uh, my sisters, my brothers and comrades. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to speak to you uh, uh, today. And I'm really happy that on a, a lovely day like this, uh, we are able to meet and knowing quick, fully well that with the pandemic that we're not able to meet the usual way in person. And yet everyone is willing to come out and virtual to talk about and hear about the, the issues at hand. I, I want to start by, by echoing the pain expressed by my sister Amira and brother Merv King, who spoke earlier about the unhearthing of the tragedy at um, Kamloops Residential School as well as the cowardly Islam Islamophobic attack in London that just last week. My heart grows heavy seeing the violence that this country is comfortably doling out to people just because of the, the color of our skin, our, uh, our faith. After living in Canada for so long, at times I, I, I become almost hardened to the petty indecency that become part of our everyday life in this racist country. I'm embarrassed to say, but you almost grow accustomed to it. I'm not sure people in this uh, conference know what I'm talking about. The ways we have to close ourselves off, the way we must contort who we are, the way we are told to sit down, shut up. You almost get used to it. It's hardened the heart. But to see the bodies of 215 children being unhearthed from the ground after being stolen from their family become too much for the soul to bear. Seeing three generations of family swipe away in an instant through an act of, of veil Racism become too hard to ignore. It reminds us who we are and why we must fight for change. It become hard maintaining that determination, that courage, hard to wake up every day and, and fight what can sometimes feel like a losing battle for equality. COVID-19 caused numbers numbers are trending down and we are we start to see some light at the end of the, the tunnel. But for workers of color, that light may be a speeding train. The pandemic has ravaged community of color with the highest infection rate and debt in our region, our community, which are most densely packed with essential workers are struggling economically as well. Workers of color most likely to have taken on debt, falling behind on bills during the pandemic. We know that for recovery to happen, these communities need to be prioritized for both their health need, their economic needs, our communities to recover that mean paid sick days, well-paid union jobs. These sort of programs don't just crop on their own to get justice to workers of color who are struggling the most, that mean government intervention, but the politicians have abandoned us. 
for Doug Ford conservative government, a COVID response mean allowing vaccination rate to be lowest in community where infection rate have been highest. Doug Ford was so cowardly and afraid to face the public outcry for the damage he has done that he refused to even make media appearance for most of those last few months. This is a premier who feel comfortable taking paid sick days after repeatedly deny, denying the same rights to so many workers. At the federal level, things aren't much better. Justin Trudeau likes to talk a big games, especially equality. He likes to kneel for the camera and cry during apology, but that doesn't make, doesn't amount to real change. Real change would mean instituting the recommendation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to begin the process of healing for indigenous people in this country. Real change would mean looking into the missing and murdered indigenous women in this country. Real change would mean disarming and defunding the RCMP, not increasing their budget. Both Trudeau and Ford attended the vigil held in, in London for the Hafsi's family after the Islamic uh, van attack just this past week. While I'm glad to see the family and the community being supported, we know from experience that all these politicians offer us are empty words and hollow prayer. It's easy for them to show up to a photo op, but it's harder to do the real work of making positive change for our community. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, it's much easier to integrate a lunch line than it is to guarantee an annual income for people of color. It is much easier to disintegrate a bus than it is to make reparation. And we all know it's much easier to make statement than it is to put an end to the violence that target people of color in Canada. But these politicians are only interested in what's easy. This is a cause to be optimistic. There is a cause to be optimistic, however. While the politician and the bosses have not changed consciousness of the public, the public, the, the general public is growing. The last year in this in this particular has seen mass movement of racial justice in our region and abroad. And it is a, it is clear that working people are ready to see real change. A year after George Floyd murder, we are still seeing mass movement with people stepping up to help one another and to give solidarity to those fighting racism everywhere. What this means for all of us in the labor movement, that it is time to stop working, to work, stop working on politician schedule and start making good trouble, get things, get things done our way. To, to, it's clear that bosses and politicians look back at the demonstration of the past year and ask themselves, Demonstration of what? Because they haven't been moved to make change. In the labor movement, we know politicians and the bosses only care about one thing and that's their pocketbook. Threatening their bottom line is the way we win. To show them what maintaining this racism system means, we need to hit them where it's hurt. Keeping this racist system intact means keeping workers of color excluded, putting workers of color in jail, and worse of all, killing them in the prime of their lives. Well, guess what? When they exclude us, their road are hard and paved. When they jail us, their children go untaught. When they kill us, the sick and the elderly in this country go untreated to remind them how essential each and every single one of us in this country is. We need to be prepared for mass strike action to show them what a world without us look like. And when they start to come to the table and listen, we need to show them we aren't interested in compromises. It's, comp it, it's compromise that has cost us all these years up until now, and it's compromise which has cost us 
cost us more lives than we can count. And now it's time for an end to the racist system in this country. But sisters and brothers, we must look into our own backyard as well. As well, we all know that when we are together, we win. But when we are alone, we merely beg. To set up on the path of victory, we must break down our barriers in our own union and institution. We must ensure we are all developing and training our young leaders of color and putting them into position of power. We must advocate and fight for changes in our constitution and our charter. We must ensure that when there is union meeting at the shop or at our local, that workers of color are, are in attendance and that their voices are heard. When I look around at the people gathered here today, I see real leaders. And that's why I'm confident we will win. I see leaders who aren't shy, who aren't afraid to be vocal and to make changes in their workplace. I want to ensure that the leaders we have here today don't let this feel like any other conference and that we, ta we take what we learn and have learned and discuss back in our union with us. I heard you to bring the Yes It Matter campaign from the Labor Council back to your leadership and implement it in your charter. Take a moment to look at the attendance of the, the next union meeting in your union and at your local and ask yourself how to increase those numbers. When we hear members discussing racism in the workplace, we need to get to them to, to a union meeting. When we see blocks of worker organizing around racism in the workplace, we need to unite them towards direct action. And when we see a whole workplace, a whole society full of people who are sick and tired of racism, sexism, homophobia, and all the form of discrimination in the workplace, we need to lead them to strike. The people are ready. They are looking for direction. And the leaders in this room need to be the one to take them where all this to go. We need to be the spark that ignite the flame. Yes, Labor Council have been on this journey for 150 years, and we need to continue that. Today, we surely can say that we are in the highs of the storm, but together we can rise. Thank you.